right. Well, welcome everybody. Happy Sunday to you. I am gaining a new appreciation for having a full week to think about a sermon, which is, I didn't know that would be such a special blessing. Uh, but uh, I see everybody's passing the bucket, so good job. Uh, you have succeeded at your first task of church. Um, all right, so for some that I don't know, my name is David Morrow. My family and I have been hanging around this church for about a decade or so, and uh, every once in a while I get a chance to open up the Word and we can dive in together, so I'm excited to do that today. And before we dive in real far, I do just want to greet our podrishioners. Uh, we do, if you don't know, we have this community of podrishioners that connect up with this church on a weekly basis, and uh, I think it's so cool, and normally they get the messages on like Monday or Tuesday, so I, I just have a special, special message of condolence for our podrishioners in Philly. Um, we love you, we're for you, and we will gladly be preparing for the Super Bowl while you mourn. So, I am so sorry. So we are in week three of our Next Level Relationship series because the kingdom is all about relationships. And the kingdom is also all about our distorted relationships at times, which means we have to do kingdom with all of us crazy people. And uh, sometimes we need some work on figuring out how do we move towards each other. And that's why the, the metaphor for this uh, series is about movement, about moving over, about moving deeper. And this week is about moving slower. So the title of the sermon is Move Slower. And, um, but, but I want to recap first kind of where we've been. So two weeks ago, Greg teed us off and he talked about moving over and he used some diagrams. And, and the first one uh, looks like this. And the diagram ultimately is showing us that every one of us at our core is made for God. That we have a core in us that can only be filled by God. And that the dream of God was that it would look like this next image, which, which shows that uh, the life, the love, the joy, the peace, the fulfilling uh, love that God can bring is supposed to flow into us and overflow in such a way that when we are in relationship, we show up not at a deficit, but we show up with abundance. And so the goal is that we would show up that way, but if you've had any experiences in relationship like me, we don't always look that way, do we? Um, sometimes it looks more like this next image where we try and suck life from status and we try and suck life from wealth and from fame and from good looks or from our gender or from uh, any number of ways that we might try and do that because if we are not getting all of our life and all of our worth from God, that hole still is there and we're going to try anything to fill it up. We are going to try anything to fill it up. So that was move over, that we need to move over to put God at the center and then last week was move deeper which was all about, uh, we looked at this word play in Genesis 2 and 3 of that we can choose between the arum of vulnerability or we can choose the arum of hiddenness. And within relationships, the only way to grow in intimacy is to choose vulnerability, but sometimes we choose hiddenness. And so it's how do we move deeper in vulnerability? And this week is about moving slower, which I think is about one of the most common areas of relational distortion, which is the art of listening. The art of listening in a world that will not stop talking. The art of listening in a world that will not stop talking. And we have these tendencies to miss each other in so many different ways in our relationships. And I want to show you a quick video that I think gets at one of the ways we miss each other. So take a look at this. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> It's not about the nail. So for our podrishioners who didn't just see that, YouTube the video, it's not about the nail. Um, but here's the thing, is like, I wish that in relationships, and my, I mean, my closest relationship is my marriage, and I wish that in marriages and any other relationship, that there would have been a manual that told me for the first few years, you're not supposed to fix the problem when they bring the problem. Like, if somebody would have told me that, that would have saved me so many hours of pain and heartache and, and realizing that, oh yeah, when you tell me the problem, you're not looking for a solution right away. Okay, got it. I'm not going to try and do that. And, and yet, we try and fix it. And, and ultimately, what it looks like is my strategies trying to fix your problems. And my strategies to fix your problems don't ever work. My strategy to deal with what's going on that is unique to you does not work. And it does not work because I don't know you. 
That if I don't listen to you, I don't know you. And if I don't know you, I can't understand what's going on. And if there was ever a more massive need I see right now, it's listening. We have such a need for listening in the church. We have such a need for listening within evangelism where there can be a tendency to just spout off the gospel without actually listening to the story of the one we're talking to. And there can be such a tendency to not listen within the context of politics that we just yell at each other and talk and, and there's no value in listening and it's such a need and it's a need for pastors, let me tell you. Um, I love this quote from Eugene Peterson who was a pastor for 40 years. I think pastors are the worst listeners. We're so used to speaking, teaching, and giving answers, we must learn to be quiet. Quit being so verbal. Learn to pay attention to what's going on and listen and listen. I think there is a massive need for listening and there's a deficit to it, but there is an art to listening. There truly is. And, and I know for me, I've run into a lot of problems trying to learn the art of listening because I have learned that there are two types of sermons one can give. One is a sermon that is given out of authority and expertise, a, dip, a deep richness of theological understanding. And then there are the other sermons that you give out of a place of weakness, out of a place of vulnerability, out of a place of, let me tell you about the pain and how I've, how I've screwed this one up. And this would be one of those for me because I've found myself doing more times than I would like to admit. I've been doing what the Proverbs tell me not to do in Proverbs 18, 13. It says, answering before listening is both stupid and rude. <laughs> answering before listening is both stupid and rude. And I wish I could tell you I learned this 10 years ago and I, now I'm better. But two weeks ago, let me tell you. Okay, so two weeks ago, I went to a birthday party uh, for my, that my son was invited to. And we're at this birthday party and I'm hanging out uh, with these good friends of mine, but I hadn't seen them for a while. So I decided to stick around and we're, we're talking together and I go with my friend Corey. We, we hop in the car and we go uh, to get some pizzas. And when we come back, um, as we're coming back, we, we're talking. And if you were here last week, you know that I hide by asking questions. So I ask lots of questions. And my favorite question to ask is, what books you're reading right now? That's my favorite one. And uh, so he starts telling me about these books he's reading. He's reading about the like hero's journey and the male initiation rites and how to go from boyhood to manhood and, and all these different things. And I'm fascinated by it. And I do what many of us do when we're listening is we start figuring out how we're going to respond. We start, before they're done talking, we're playing it out in our head. What am I going to say? What am I going to say? And when he stops talking, I start telling him, Corey, guess what? Like a year and a half ago, I went on this retreat and it was incredible. And the, the folks were talking about the same stuff. Like they were talking about the hero's journey. They were talking about like initiation rites from boyhood to manhood that have been lost and now they need to come back. And so I start going on and on and on about this retreat that I went on. And when I'm finally done, he looks at me and says, David, you know I was on that retreat with you, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I like... I honestly had forgotten. Like, I, I, I could have told you every book I bought on that retreat, but I had no recollection that he was there. Like, it was me and him and two other people, and we were in New Mexico. Like, I seriously should have remembered he was there, but I didn't. And much of that probably revolves around that he was talking, and I was just rehearsing my answer. I wasn't paying attention to what he was saying <sighs> and, and some of it is the result of my personality and some of it is just our personalities. And so, so like I'm, I'm an introvert, um, but I'm also like for you Enneagram nerds, I'm a five. Uh, and what, what this means for me is that all interactions that involve a deep amount of listening and engaging, like it literally feels like an energy suck for me. Like, I, if, if my energy is a gas tank, these types of conversations quickly have it going from full to empty. And I can feel it. I can feel it. And so sometimes I avoid it because it makes me feel so depleted. And it's created harm in relationships. One relationship I can remember that it created some harm in was when I was 16 years old. And uh, I, I remember my mom and I, we were in uh, the car and my mom's driving and we're going through a car wash. And, and my mom does what I think is such a bold thing to do. She says, David, um, so your sisters and I, my, I have two older sisters, we have the kind of relationship where like we talk to each other. 
um, you know, like say words back and forth and communicate feelings and talk about what's going on and what's, what we're, what's hurting, what's making us joyful, what significant other we might be interested in, like what we're thinking about God. Like we do all these things. We talk and talk and talk. And then she looks at me and does what I think is one of the most vulnerable things a mom could ever do is she looks at me and says, David, are you interested in that kind of relationship with me? And what, <laughs> what happened is my brain immediately started calculating how t- difficult that would be and how much energy it would take to have that kind of relationship. And while I wish I could have said I had a different response, what my actual response was, can I get back to you on that, mom? <laughs> Which my mom was here at the nine o'clock service, so I did a public apology for her. Um, But here's the thing is that in the midst of all the different ways we experience listening, all the different ways that for some of us it's draining, for others of us it's it's exhilarating, but in the midst of that we need to learn to listen and James chapter 1 has this wisdom for us. My dear brothers and sisters, take note. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And and I am convinced that our culture believes the exact opposite most of the time. That we have a tendency to be quick to speak, slow to listen, and quick to become angry. And some of that has to do with just the level of distraction we have. That there are so many ways to communicate now, and so few ways to truly listen. That I can communicate by pulling out my phone and writing something on Twitter, or I can communicate by posting something, or I can communicate by sending you a text, but where are the places where we get to sit and listen deeply to each other and actually hear each other's story and learn something that we need to know? And, And I am convinced that in the midst of that, God says, I want you to lead with your ears, not with your mouth. That he wants us to lead, to start with our ears and not with our mouth, and yet For me, it's such a hard thing, and I think for some of us, it's so hard, and there are some challenges to effective listening, and what we're going to do for our remaining time is look at three core challenges to effective listening, and then we're going to wrap up by looking at a few lessons for how do we live this out practically, and and so the first challenge to effective listening is our severed connection with God. It is our severed connection with God because here's the thing, the whole point of a relationship with God is that when I am connected with God, when I'm getting all my life and all my love and all my joy from God, then I'm listening to God. And if that is the voice I am hearing, that will fill me up and remind me of who I really am. But to the degree I'm not doing that, I'm listening to other voices and I wonder which voices we're listening to. I wonder which voices are speaking into our lives and in our hearts that are not God. And the result of this severed connection with God is that we miss God. We miss God. And and what's fascinating is that there are over a hundred times in the Bible where the people of God are told they're not listening. You're not listening, you're not listening, you're not listening, you're not listening. And what is so great about scripture is that it has so many good negative object lessons for how not to do things, um, which I, I think for me is kind of comforting about scripture because I can, I, I can see myself in it. I can see myself there. And I want to show you one example of this from Psalm 81. It says this, hear me, my people, and I will warn you if you'd only listen to me, Israel. You shall have no foreign God among you. You shall not worship any God other than me. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of, the, out of Egypt. Open wide your mouth and I will fill it. But my people wouldn't listen to me. Israel would not submit to me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own devices. If my people would only listen to me. If Israel would only follow my ways. I wonder how many relational issues that we have or issues that we have politically or issues globally could have been solved if we would have been listening to the right voices first. If we would have been hearing from God before we started spouting off to others. Because there is this interconnectedness between my ability to hear from God and be connected to God and my ability to connect with other people well. And my ability to listen to other people well. And here's how Dietrich Bonhoeffer puts it, which I both love and hate all at the same time, because it hurts. 
He who can no longer listen to his brother will soon be no longer listening to God. He will be doing nothing but prattling, talk, 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 talk in the presence of God. And this is the beginning of the death of the spiritual life. Anyone who thinks that his time is too valuable to spend keeping quiet will eventually have no time for God and his brother, but only for himself and for his own follies, for his own follies. Because prayer without listening is not prayer. Prayer is communication. Prayer is a back and forth. And if I spend all my time prattling, if I spend all my time just talk, talk, talking to God, but I don't actually have time to listen, then that severed connection with God starts happening. Which leads to the second challenge of effective listening, which is assumptions. Assumptions. Now, in my conversation with Corey, I had some assumptions. I knew exactly where he was going, so I didn't have to listen anymore, right? The assumptions, they get in the way of our ability to listen. And I am convinced that the opposite of listening is not talking. The opposite of listening is waiting to speak. That the opposite of listening is waiting to speak because if I'm just waiting, getting ready to put my own words in, then I start to miss it. And there's all sorts of ways we can assume things. And um, so my daughter, uh, she's 10, and she's the type of person that if she goes through a day and has not come out with a earth-shattering, ground-breaking, fantastically vibrant and new idea, it's been a terrible day. Like, she is the type that will, that will try and rally all the kids in our neighborhood together and say, okay, we are going to write a play, put a play on, sell tickets for the play, and then have it at our house today. Like, all those things are going to happen today, and, and my role in the family is to kind of ask the questions. And so I'll say things like, well, June, have you ever written a play? Well, no. Well, have you ever, like, you know, directed a play? No. Have you ever, you know, sold tickets for a play, and am I getting a cut on that because it's at my house? Like, I start asking all these different questions and, and what happens and what has happened a number of times and now has become a kind of famous phrase around our house is I was doing this once with Junia where she gets dreaming and I start shutting it down with my questions and she looked at me and said, Dad, stop killing me with logic. <laughs> Dad, stop killing me with logic because I was assuming I knew better than she did how this was going to work out and what, if I'm honest... of the time, it works out better than I could have imagined. And our assumptions, they can get in the way of things. And and while sometimes it's at at home, but but other times when when assumptions kind of leave the building of our home and what can feel like a somewhat safe setting, when they move out into the culture, they become something different. Our assumptions become bias. And when they become bias, I mean, bias is essentially just an implicit assumption. And most times we don't even know we're doing it, but it's an implicit assumption about your worth, about my worth, about our worth. And I, I'm convinced that we as a church and we as a culture have a desperate need to be listened to. We have a desperate need to be heard. And we have a desperate need for more dialogue and less debate. We have a desperate need for a a culture, and I think it starts in the church, but a culture where, like, if bias gets combined with an unwilling to hear, you just have noise. That you just have noise and nobody listens to each other, and I wonder what it could look like if the church was a place where anyone, no matter their sexual orientation, no matter their gender, no matter their race, no matter their education, no matter their politics, would actually show up and be listened to because they are not labeled first. That I wonder what it could look like if we as a church were determined and we said, it is obvious here that I am more interested in knowing you than any label that I'm told about you. That if you show up here and you are gay, if you are homeless, if you are wealthy, if you are poor, if you are educated, if you are uneducated, if you are... African, if you are Haitian, if you are any other race, any other category, that we would say, I can't know you unless I listen to you first. Because there is something true about the core of who you are that cannot be labeled or stereotyped. That I am unwilling to put you into a box because I actually believe that this church could be an assumption-busting church. 
that we could be an assumption-busting church and we could actually say, we are going to give everybody a fair shake because I believe what God says about you is way more true than what anybody else labels you as. That what God says about you is way more true than what anybody else labels about and that the only assumption I'm allowed to have about you is that you are made in the image of God. That the only assumption I can have is you are made in the image of God and I'm going to have the same assumption that Paul had in 1 Corinthians 2 where he said, I resolve to know nothing except Christ Jesus and him crucified. That I know nothing about you unless you tell me and unless I'm listening, I know nothing about you except what Jesus declared about you on the cross, which is that you have indescribable worth and you could not be loved more than you are right now. And what could it be like? Can you imagine How many people would walk into this room if they knew this was a place where the assumptions were busted because they were actually, we actually wanted to get to know them, the unique them, the unique them that God created in all their pain and all their joy and all their mess and all their junk, but I'm not going to label them to say, well, I know you because I, well, you know, I grew up on the same side of town or I have the same skin color or, you know, we we have the same kind of economic status. I don't know you. I don't know you unless I listen to you. And we have a desperate need to listen. Amen? Amen. We have a desperate need to listen. And yet when we don't do that, we start looking like a negative object lesson of some comforters in the book of Job. Look at how they get described in Job 16. I've heard all this before, Job says. What miserable comforters you are. Won't you ever stop your flow of foolish words, which is the Hebrew word ruach, which means wind. So I, I kind of think he's calling them windbags. Um, <laughs> what have I said that makes you speak so endlessly? What have I said? And, and to the degree that we start speaking before we're listening, we're buying into the assumptions because we think we already know, but we don't. And we don't. And I want to be a part of an assumption-busting church. That's what I want to be a part of. Which leads us to the third challenge of effective listening, which is cultural validation. And this one's a little strange, but the basic idea is that within our culture, the ones who are given the authority, that are given the place of power, are the ones who talk, not the ones who listen. When was the last time you watched a, some kind of cable news channel where they just gave you the close-up of the person that was doing some great active listening? Just going, hmm, tell me more. I'm really interested in your opinion. That'd be great. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it's, like, it's hot-headed people who look like their brain's about to explode, but, but they're the ones talking and yelling and fighting and going at it. And our culture just validates that because that's the one who shows up. That's the one who shows up on screen. That's the one who shows up in so many different places in a place of power and the culture just validates it. And so we just start, keep going after it thinking, is that what I need to do in order to be heard? Do I need to just be the loudest one in the room? And and, uh, one of my favorite negative object lessons of this in scripture is King Solomon. Now, King Solomon is the son of King David, who is the most famous king in the story of scripture. And Solomon, in the story we're going to look at, he is, he's just become king. His dad has recently died and he's trying to figure out if he's got what it takes. This job feels too big and he doesn't think he's going to be able to do it. And so he goes to this place called Gibeon to sacrifice some animals because that's what they assumed God wanted. And when he's doing this, he falls asleep and God shows up to him in a dream. And God says to him in the dream, what do you want me to do for you? And for those of you that have been around church for a while, what does Solomon ask for? Wisdom, wisdom, wisdom. Nope, he doesn't, which is fascinating because that's what I thought a few months ago and then I, like, I started digging into it and I was like, I thought it was wisdom he wanted. So, okay, so we're going to dive into the story. So this is 1 Kings chapter 3. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream and God said, ask for whatever you want me to give you. Solomon answered, you have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You've continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, Lord, my God, you've made your servant king in place of my father David, but I'm only a little child and I don't know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you've chosen, a great people, too numerous to count. So give your servant a discerning heart, which is the Hebrew lev shema, to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong, For who is able to govern this great people of yours? 
So what does Solomon ask for? A discerning heart. Which I think is fascinating because even that I don't think gets at the Hebrew there. So, so there's two words in Hebrew. The first is lev. And lev is simply, it's the heart. Um, but, but even more so, it's the inner person. It's this place where when we are getting all of our life and love and joy and peace from God, this is where it shows up, in our lev, in our core. And Solomon asks for a core, an inner person of Shema which is the Hebrew word for to hear or to listen. So literally what Solomon asks for is a listening heart. That what he is saying he needs is a place deep inside of him that only can come from God and can't be manufactured that is listening. Because there is a difference between hearing and listening. Hearing is an act of my senses, but listening is an act of the will. Listening I choose. And I was trying to figure out how do we uh, kind of think about that distinction. And well, so what I want to try and do is we're going to take 30 seconds and be quiet in here. And what I want you to do is if you want to close your eyes, you can, but I want you to listen. And if you hear, let, see, notice if you hear any noises you didn't hear before or any sounds you may have missed before. So let's take 30 seconds. What did you hear? What did you notice? Yeah, the creaking of the stage as I'm walking along. What else did you hear? Van. Vans? Van. Oh, the fan. Yeah. Yeah, the fans. You could hear those. Anybody hear anything else? Baby. Coughing. I heard a baby. baby. Woo woo. <laughs> Somebody's growling stomach. <laughs> but here's the thing the difference between hearing and and listening is paying attention. Because all of those sounds, your brain was already hearing. But it told you, okay, I'm going to filter these things out to help you listen to what you need to pay attention to right now. And much of the time, what happens in our relationships is that we hear somebody, but we're not actually listening to them because we're not paying full attention to them. We're not giving them the focus that we need. And I think it's interesting because what can happen is that we try and listen, but we haven't practiced one of the first skills of good listening, which, which comes from this uh, book I was reading by a guy named Adam McHugh. He says that good listening starts with the scandalous premise that this conversation is not about you. <laughs> Take that. So, so he, re, he wrote a book called The Listening Life, and I, I just want to highlight it because I thought it was really helpful. Um, and if you're looking for a good book, I'd really recommend it. But here's the thing. The scandalous pre uh, assumption is that the conversation is not about you, and in many ways, that is the great tragedy of Solomon's life. That somewhere along the way, he forgot that this wasn't all about him. Because somewhere along the way, he started to believe the press that what he said was more important than how he listened. He started to chase the cheers of those who had come to see him, and people came from all over the world to hear Solomon. They came from all over the world. They came from Egypt. They came from Tyre. They came from uh, all the surrounding nations. And scripture actually has a verse that said they came from every nation in the world to hear Solomon. But you notice that it says they came to hear Solomon. And somewhere along the way, he forgot that wisdom was supposed to be the byproduct of a listening heart. And when you stop listening, you stop having the wisdom to give. And that if I start thinking that my gift is the wisdom, then I stop thinking that I need to listen. But the reality is that if I'm not listening, I don't have the wisdom anymore. That if I don't listen, I don't have the wisdom anymore. And for Solomon, this went bad really fast. This went bad really fast and he stopped listening to those around him and he stopped listening to God. And at the end of his life, here's what we see in 1 Kings 11. The Lord was very angry with Solomon for his lev had turned away from the Lord. He severed the connection with the God of Israel who appeared to him twice. He had warned Solomon specifically about worshiping gods, but Solomon did not shema 
to the Lord's command. This lev that is the place where we receive the love, the life, the wholeness of God had stopped listening for Solomon. And eventually where it goes for Solomon is where it goes for many of us is that when we stop listening, it starts distorting all of our relationships. And for him, it started distorting his relationship with his own son, who when his son became king, you, you see this incredible narrative right after Solomon dies in 1 Kings 12 with his son Rehoboam. And Rehoboam is trying to figure out, how do I be king now? And he has this first group of counselors come to him and they say, well, here's what you should do. Lead with gentleness. Lead with love. Lead with a listening heart. Lead with humility. And he looks at him and says, nah, don't want that. And so he goes to the next group and, and he says, well, how should I lead? And they say, be ruthless. Double down on your father's anger. Double down on the power. Double down on the authority. Double down on all of it and make the people fear you. And he does that. He listens to the wrong voices. And when he does that, the kingdom of Israel splits and it never comes back together. That there are massive implications for us not listening. Which is why I think in many ways for Solomon, the wisdom itself was a curse. Because the wisdom itself is what severed his connection with God because he thought that he could do it on his own. He thought that he could do it on his own and I wonder where we do that in our own lives. I wonder where we think we can do it on our own or we think that the byproduct of a gift that God has given us, we think that's the gift itself rather than the gift that God has given us. Because here's the thing. This church needs everyone in this room playing their part in the kingdom of God for this to work. That everyone in this room has a gift and everyone in this room has something that they are meant to do as a part of the body of Christ. And to the degree that we don't do it, for whatever reason, we start to, to, to believe the lie that, well, my part isn't significant. My part isn't as important. The part that I play isn't as valuable. We believe the cultural validation that the one who's speaking is the one who's important when the reality is it's the one with the listening heart that God wanted. That it's the one with the listening heart that God wanted. And the reality is that the more power we have, the less we normally listen. Because power is an incredibly effective earplug. Power is an incredibly effective earplug. It's why the phrase speaking truth to power is so true because most people in power have their ears shut off to those who might be listening and those who might be trying to talk to them. Which leads us, uh, as we wrap up, with a few lessons for effective listening. And the first lesson for effective listening, after we've moved through these challenges, is to get all of our life from Christ. Get all of our life from Christ. Th this is something we could not hammer too many times here at Woodland Hills because the reality is, if we do not get all of our life from Christ, then I'm going to start trying to get life from you by getting you to listen to me rather than me listening to you out of humility. Out of, rather than me listening to you out of humility. And getting our life from Christ is ultimately about having a rhythm where we hear from God. And he says, I love you. I'm for you. I'm with you. There's nothing you have to do to earn it. There's nothing you have to do to earn it. And it starts by having a listening heart because if I'm not listening to God, then I'm not praying because prayer without listening is not prayer. And it's a learned practice and, and in many ways, it's about modeling the very character of God because listening is about emptying ourselves of control. Because when I'm not talking and I'm listening, I have to let somebody else take the wheel. And we need somebody else to take the wheel in our lives. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So that's the first lesson for effective listening. The second one is that we need to learn to listen with our whole self. Now, my son Isaac is five, and one of the things that Isaac likes to do is he always has a story or a joke or something new that he wants to tell us, so he'll come up to me and he'll say, Daddy, listen to this. And I'll say, yeah, 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 I'm listening. And he'll say, no, 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 Daddy, listen to this. And I'll say, yeah, yeah, Isaac, I'm listening. And then eventually he'll grab my face and he'll say, no, Daddy, listen with your eyes. Amen. Listen with your eyes because listening is supposed to be a whole body experience. Because do you know that most communication specialists say that at minimum, 65% of what you say is nonverbal? That the reality is that how I am listening is actually saying more to the person I'm listening to than the words that they're saying to me. Because how I listen ascribes worth to the person that, I'm, that is speaking. 
Because if I am listening, but I'm just, you know, zoned out saying, you know, somebody texted me, hold on, just hold that incredibly uh, deep and vulnerable thought. I just need to respond to this person. And the reality is that is communicating far more than I could ever communicate by listening. And we need to pay attention to how we listen because it matters whether I'm focused on you. It matters whether I'm kind of like this sitting back in my chair. Like, it matters how people experience you when you listen because we need to listen with our whole self. And one of the most vulnerable things that we can do is to seek feedback on this, but I think it's the only way we get better. is to find somebody that you can trust to say, how do you experience me as a listener? Do I seem engaged? Does it seem like I'm paying attention to you with everything I've got? Because when we listen with our whole self, not only do we hear what's going on, but we also ascribe worth to that person. And that is so central to the kingdom of God. And the final uh, lesson that I want to leave you with is just a couple listening skills because it, it starts with a listening heart by being connected with God. But as I mentioned to you at the beginning, this has been a journey for me of trying to figure out how to listen well and I needed some skills. And the first skill is I needed to figure out how to get curious by asking some open-ended questions. Because when I get curious, it starts to bust the assumptions because I start to ask questions and open-ended questions are just ones that can't be answered with a yes or a no. And here's the thing, Jesus is a master at this. As I was looking through the Gospels, here's just a couple that I came across very quickly. Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? What are you looking for? Why were you searching for me? Who do you ask me about what is good? Why do you ask me about what is good? Why are you so afraid? Who do you say that I am? Why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Why were you arguing on the road? What were you fighting about? That when we start getting curious and asking questions, it invites a deeper conversation. It ascribes worth to the other person and it reminds them that we're not boxing them in. I'm not boxing you in. I can't assume I know what your story is. And so one of the skills is to learn how to get curious by asking open-ended questions. And the other skill that I think is helpful is reflections, which is, it's just speaking back to the person what you hear, but, but, but ultimately what it is is about showing up in humility in conversation. To say, I'm not going to assume that I know what you're talking about, so I'm going to say it right back to you and hope I got it right. And if I didn't, I give you the opportunity to tell me. And I... I've wondered what that could look like, like in the story I told you about my daughter where if she comes home and she says, Dad, here's the deal. I'm going to get all the neighbors together. I'm going to write a play. We're going to do a play. We're going to sell tickets and then we're going to have it at three o'clock this afternoon. What would happen if I said, instead of what I normally say, said back to her, you're really confident this is going to happen. Can you imagine the switch that would happen as she starts to realize her dad believes in her and is hearing her and trusts her. Because what do I lose by doing that? I lose nothing. I lose nothing, but when we show up with humility, we're able to hear what's going on. And, and I think one of the challenges is that we need to beware of moving on to our own story too quickly when we're listening. That it can be so easy and such a quick fix to somebody tells you what's going on and if I'm not getting all my life from God, I, I relate to it so then I jump in with my own story. of Oh yeah, you did that? Yeah, let me tell you about how I did that too. And then we start, we, we miss going deeper into what's really at the root of what's happening by we don't ask the right questions and then it, the conversation just turned back on us and we're not listening. And I think that we fail people in pain when we try and heal them before we hear them that we fail people in pain or people in joy when we try and heal them before we hear them. And as people of God, we need to be the kind that will hear them because it forces us to slow down, which is the movement that we're going for. So my prayer for us is that we would be a church that lives the example of Jesus in having a listening heart, ones that ask the right kinds of questions, and that we would be an assumption-busting church, and that those who think that they're far off from God would walk in here and realize that people are interested in me. They want to know my story. They want to hear what's going on. And so my prayer is that as we live in a desperate world to be heard, that we would be the kind of people who at first get all of our life from God and then can overflow in that in having a listening heart to those around us. Amen?
Amen. So would you stand with me as we close? Um, I'm going to invite the prayer teams to come forward. If there is any prayer whatsoever that uh, you would like to talk to somebody about, or may, maybe there's something where you have not been listened to about something for a long time, and these folks could listen to you and pray over you, they would love to do that. And if you have never had an opportunity to get to know or begin a relationship with Jesus, the one who asks the questions that lead to more conversation, they would love to introduce you to that Jesus. So would you come and talk to them? And as we go, my prayer, Woodland Hills, is that we would move slower in our relationships. That we would lead with listening and realize that we, when we lead with listening, then we earn the right to speak. Amen? Have a great Sunday. Go Vikings.